Hello everyone, welcome to my first Q&A. I've actually been really excited about this because you've been sending in a lot of very interesting and intelligent questions. So I'm very pleased to be answering these. So uh, here are the, uh, the six questions that I chose that we'll be answering today. So uh, number one, uh, what does your d typical daily practice routine consist of? Number two, what is your favorite pick to use when playing fast material? Three, and this was a generalized question because so many of you asked about this. How do I get better at improvising? That's a good one. Four, how did you compose your own music? Five, how did you mix your album? And six, the biggest of all, and this is probably going to take up a big chunk of the end of this video, uh, and it's relating to how do you build uh, lead guitar speed in general. So um, let's get stuck right into these questions. So number one, what does your typical daily practice routine consist of? This is asked by subscriber Aaron Hunt. Well, Aaron, thanks for asking that. Um, I suppose a few of you want a bit of insight into my daily practice routine. Uh, let me start by saying this. Uh, Star Trek episodes are 45 minutes long, and coincidentally enough, so are my practice sessions. <laughs> um, so, okay, so I get up and I have breakfast, and then I'll chuck on an episode of Star Trek or something. Just something that I've already seen, I've, I've seen it all so many times. But something that's nice and interesting to have in the background while I'm doing my practice sessions so I don't go completely mad. And yeah, so I'll have that playing in the background and I'll start my first 45 minute practice session. And I might do something like um, riffs for 45 minutes. And these won't be riffs that I can already do. There's no point in doing that. These will be riffs that I'm working on that I'm currently struggling with because you should always be working on what you're bad at. And then after that, I'll go straight into another episode and I'll do something different. I might do economy picking, for instance. Again, working on economy picking that I'm struggling with at the moment. And then I might have some lunch. I might go to the gym after that. And then I'll come back. And believe it or not, I'll watch another two episodes of Star Trek. Deep Space Nine, TNG, whatever. And so I might do something like, I don't know, two-way pick slanting, alternate picking on two strings. Get some Vinnie Moore type stuff going. And then I might do another 45 minutes of just scale sequencing. So that's three hours. Uh, of practice done and I've been mildly entertained the whole time which is good and so what do I do for my fourth hour of practice because I usually do about four or five hours a day I might do I might put on like a nature documentary like an hour long nature documentary and do sweet picking so three string four string five string six string and then melodies combining them all I'll, I'll do that for an hour just to cover all bases when it comes to sweet picking and then for the final hour, I will do an hour of jamming. So just going on YouTube, finding a jam track that I like and just playing over it and exercising my creativity every day. I always make a point to do that and you should too. So I hope this um, gave you all some insight, <clears throat> especially you, Aaron, into my typical daily practice routine. So thanks for that question. On to number two. <clears throat> Braden asks, what is your favorite pick to use when you play fast material? So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I'm sure a bunch of you are aware that I'm sponsored by Hawk Picks. And they're a UK based pick manufacturer. And I, I do think they make some of the finest picks in the world. And so I'll just put a picture up on screen now. I've got my own custom pick. It's a AP Blackhawk Tonebird 8. And this is in matte black, 1.4 millimeters thick. And it's based off a Jazz 3 XL, but it's got wider, pointier flanks. It's got this arrowhead type shape to it for greater stability in the picking hand, which I absolutely love. I use this, the Rolls Royce of guitar picks, when I'm jamming, when I'm improvising, when I'm recording jam tracks, and when I'm recording tracks of my own for my albums and my songs. Um, because it's a real piece of uh, guitar gear. It's not just a cheap plastic pick. 
Though, mind you, saying that, when I'm just doing my picking practice, burning through picks every day, I do just use the cheap Jazz 3 XLs that you can buy from uh, any local guitar store. But when I'm jamming and all that, and I'm actually making music, <coughs> um, I use the Hawk picks. So, um, <coughs> to answer your question in another way, in case you were wondering about um, thickness, yeah, I, I do use like, you know, well, Jazz 3s are 1.38 mils, and my Hawk pick is 1.4 mil. So, I don't know, is that thick? It's certainly not thin like what Paul, Paul Gilbert would use, because he uses like 0.7s or something, doesn't he? Anyway, I hope that answers your question. Number three, now this is the generalized question, because so many people asked about this. How do I get better at improvising? Well, I've got just the solution for you. I came up with this years ago, and I called it like the weekly jam track challenge. And it's as simple as this. Go on YouTube, find a jam track that you like. And it has to be one that you like, because you're going to be playing over this for the next week. Half an hour every day for seven days. So you download it off YouTube, and you put it into your recording program. I use Ableton. And what you do with uh, what you do then is you just loop it. As I said, for half an hour, you'll play over it every day. And so the first day, you won't really know what you're doing, and you'll be trying out everything. You'll be trying out licks in all different places, trying to land on notes over different chords to see how you can make, uh, make music over it, really. Um, but day two, you'll have the benefit of having day one under your belt. So you'll remember what worked and what didn't. And so you'll be making a bit more um, coherence over the jam track. And then day three, even more so. Day four, even more so. And all the while, you've got to have the goal of creating a solo. That's the point. Because on day seven, you're going to record what you've got. And on day seven, you should be so familiar with the track, so comfortable with the track, um, and well rehearsed, that you will have a solo ready to go. It's at this point that you record your solo, and then just save it to file folder, and then forget about it. Because tomorrow is Monday, and it's time for you to start the weekly jam track challenge again. So go back on YouTube, get a brand new jam track, and do it all again. So you're just making solos every week. And this is the best way to do this. This is what I came up with, and it really does work. Because you're exercising your improv skills, you're exercising your melody creation skills, you're exercising your licks and lick integration skills, and you're coming up with a, a fresh solo every week. It really is the best way to do it. So thanks for that question, um, all of you who asked that. This, and this kind of leads me into this next question, number four by Lex Luthor. How does you compose your own music? Well, I won't... Uh, okay, so my first album, Argonaut, uh, the, the, the rhythms are rather simple. Uh, I based them off like, late 80s Vinnie Moore and Tony Mac Alpine. So it's all very much just power chords and chugging power chords. So I won't get into that. But the solos, I recorded them in the exact, uh, using the same creative process as the weekly jam track challenge. I would... So in Ableton my recording program, I'd have my whole track laid out in front of me and I would put the looping brackets around maybe 30 seconds of track that I wanted to lay down a solo over. And then what I'd do is just loop it for like an hour and a half and just try out all my ideas, all my good ideas, all my bad ideas, everything gets tried. And each time it would loop, I would you know, hold on to the good ideas and drop the bad ideas. And it's just this process of evolution. And after one and a half hours, I'd have a solo ready to go that I'm really pleased with. So I would take off the looping brackets, I'd rewind a bit for a bit of a run up, and then I'd just record the solo that I'd came up with in just one take. So, and that's how I recorded every solo on my album, with the exception of the outro solo for track number two, Pillars of Creation. That really was just a one shot, totally improvised, uh, because that's the way that I wanted to do it. And you can kind of hear there are some mistakes in there, some missed notes. But I like that kind of um, organic, uh, improvised feel that I got from it. And I was pleased with the results. So that's, uh, for me, composing solos is that simple. So thank you for the question, Lex Luthor. Number five. We are powering through these. Okay, this, was, this is from Jonas. How did you mix your album? Okay. That is a different question. 
Um, and I'll start by saying, when it comes to mixing, or being a sound engineer, uh, amateur or otherwise, it's your job to give every instrument its own place in the mix, its own place in the stereo spectrum, its own uh, place uh, frequency-wise. So a bass guitar, for instance, that's a very bassy instrument, isn't it? So when you were EQing that, you would want to keep its low frequencies rather prominent and then slope away towards the treble side of things so that the mids aren't really there and the treble certainly isn't. And then, you know, the rhythm guitars would probably be somewhere in the middle of the EQ curve. That's how, probably how you do that. So some bass, some treble, but most of it you'd be tweaking around in the mids. And then, oh, I don't know, things like hi-hats and cymbals and vocals would be more on the trebly side of things. So you boost your highs and you'd cut the other ones. And so what, what you get from that is you have your bass in this part of the EQ range, rhythm guitars in the middle, and then your vocals and your cymbals and stuff on the high, the, the higher end of things. And this way nothing fights for attention uh, frequency-wise. Uh, nothing cancels out. And you've got to pan things as well, that's very important. So when I'm recording drums, for instance, I use real drum samples and I put each individual drum, like kick, snare, all those things, on a separate track, and I pan them separately, and I EQ them separately. So, you know, your toms you might have off to one side, and then, sorry, so one tom would be off to, off to the side, and another tom would be slightly off more to the side to make it sound like they're kind of in line, off to the side. Um, my cymbals I'd probably put on the other side. Kick drum I'd put in the middle, and I'd EQ it rather deep, so a lot, with a lot of bass. Um, and I just kind of build it up like that and eventually you get a realistic enough sounding drum kit. Um, so, right, this is something which I really do want to talk about. Recording rhythm guitars. Have you heard of double tracking? Because you need to do this in order to uh, create professional sounding rhythm guitars. Here's how you do it. You, uh, here's how I do it. Okay, so you record one whole take of the rhythm track, just rhythm guitars. And this is going to sound strange, but you pan this 100% to the left, so it's only coming out of the left channel, out of your left ear. And then you record the whole thing again, a fresh take on a separate track, and you pan that 100% to the right ear. And then what you do is you apply the Haas effect, H A S. And um, what you do to achieve this is you put a, a tiny track delay on one of those tracks. It doesn't matter which. Uh, anywhere from like negative uh, one milliseconds to negative 10 milliseconds. A uh, sweet spot for me is about negative seven. That's what I, I like to use in all my recordings. And so once you've done that, you'll have this very rich, deep and lively sound. And the harsh effect of putting the delay on one of the tracks creates this audio illusion, this like, uh, surround sound kind of audio illusion which will give your rhythm guitars a real professional sound and if you don't do these tricks you're going to end up with really thin sounding rhythm guitars and I don't think your music is ever going to sound professional so please take my advice when mixing rhythm guitars this is how you do it although I'd love to hear some comments because I know that other people have different techniques so if you mix your rhythm guitars differently please do leave a comment and let me know because I'm also just willing to learn um, the whole sound engineer thing, there's so much to learn. Okay, that was, a, that was a big question, but not as big as this one. Okay, number six, Gabriel Ortega, he says, Hi buddy, I have a question for you. What is the best way to build speed on the guitar? I've practiced hours and hours and I don't see results. Okay, that's a whopper. Um, Let's see. Okay, first, before we begin, we've got to challenge the age-old specious axiom that you get thrown around all the time, and that is, um, if you want to play fast, you've got to play slow. And this is the damaging kind of advice that beginner guitarists have been getting served for decades now. Excuse me. And it's damaging because while it is partially true, you'll never be able to play fast if you don't put in uh, 
you put your practice time with slow stuff. It isn't true, really. Uh, slow practice has a function, yes. And fast practice has a function. Slow practice is what you do when you want to build up the very core fundamentals. When you're building your muscle memory, you know, you're trying to synchronize your hands, that kind of thing. Once you can do things at a slow speed, there's no need to do it anymore. Uh, if your wish is to get faster, you need to start playing faster. Because if you only play slowly all the time, your hands, they think, they think they're doing a good job. Because as far as they're concerned, you're telling them to play slowly all the time. So that's what they do. There's no incentive for them to get faster. Do you know what I mean? Uh, let's say that you went to the gym, I don't know, five days a week, and you just did bicep curls all the time. And that's ridiculous, you'd never do that, right? You'd mix it up. But let's just say for the, the sake of this simile, you go to the gym five days a week, you do bicep curls every day. And you just use little weights, the same little weights, every time you go. Now, what incentive is there for you, um, for you to get stronger, for your muscles to get bigger? There is none. So don't go thinking that one day, after lifting the same little weights every day, one day you're going to be able to go in and pick up the big weights and start like throwing those around. That's never going to happen. You've got to bridge the gaps. You've got to, you've got to hit all the increments in between slow and fast. You've got to pick up a slightly heavier weight and then like a slightly heavier weight again over time, over years, until eventually you hit those big weights and you think, wow, what a journey. And so this is exactly the same with guitar practice. If you want to get fast, you've got to keep pushing yourself to get faster. That's the only way to do it. You've got to place uh, your brain and your hands under immense stress. <clears throat> so I think we should perhaps cover an example just so you know exactly what I'm getting at here. Uh, very few people seem to know how to use a metronome properly. So I'm going to tell you how to use a metronome properly and I'll give you an example. So let's say that um, a student wanted to build up their downward pick slanting, alternate picking. They wanted to get fast at doing like bursts just to develop a good, clean, accurate, fast technique. So let's say that they were going to pick one note because you know I love boring plain exercises, right? They're going to play one note and just pick it nine times. So 16th note, it'll be one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one. That'll be the exercise, just one note. They need to start at 60 beats per minute, really slow, and just uh, just try and get out one perfect rep. Okay, so one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one. And the moment they do one perfect rep, they need to bump up the metronome by two beats per minute. Do it again. Did they do it perfectly? Yes, they did. Bump it up, another two. So now they're at 64 beats per minute. Okay, they did a perfect rip, so bump it up to 66. And the idea is that they'd keep doing this over like a 45 minute to an hour long practice session until they reach their upper limit. So let's say hypothetically that their student's upper limit is 160. They can do this at 160, but for some reason when they go to 162, they can't do it anymore. What does this mean? It means they've reached uh, their upper limit of 160, not 162, 160. So, practice diary. They write down for that day, upper limit 160. And now this is where the weight training similarly comes back into play again. They, for the final 10 minutes of their practice session, they stay at 160 and they just bust out reps, just exhausting their hands, really letting them know, I expect more of you. I expect you to get faster. And you know, so help me God if you don't. So that's, that's what's happening. Um, and then once they're done with that 10 minutes of just really giving it their all at their upper limit, that's it, they're done. <clears throat> but it's not over yet because day two, they're gonna do it all over again, starting right back from a crawl at 60 and over like 45 minutes or an hour, they're going to bring it back up to their upper limit, which they'll reach, of course, because they're capable. They'll reach 160. And you know what? They might even uh, get to 162 and get a perfect rep. So what does that mean? Put it up to 164. And you know what? They might even be able to get a perfect rep 
at 164 as well. At which point you take it up. Uh, they take it up again to 166. Um, let's see. Right, but at 166 they can't do it. At the moment it's just too fast for them. But look what they've done. In one day they've come up 4 beats per minute in speed. So they write it down. 164 is the new upper limit. 166, just out of reach for now, but who knows, they might get it on day three. Um, these results will start to drop off as you get faster and faster. It really is a case of diminishing returns. You need to put in more and more effort to get less and less speed increase. But I mean, that's just, um, that's an asymptote, isn't it? They're everywhere in nature, so there you are. Uh, one more thing I will say about this is that you will reach a point where you feel you've prematurely plateaued. You know, it just doesn't seem right that you should not be getting any faster. You've been following this procedure. You deserve to get faster. Okay, well, you've hit a plateau. That's fine. It's totally normal. Here are two techniques that I would give you to bust through a plateau and to continue building speed. Okay, the first is the pullback double up which is where you would drop 10 beats per minute uh, lower than your upper limit. So let's say the person, the hypothetical student, got to 170 and they couldn't get past it. Um, okay, they drop back down to 160. But instead of going 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, they double it. 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1. So now they've doubled the length of the exercise and they drop down the speed a little bit. That's one little technique that you can use. Uh, now the second is a slightly more popular and slightly more famous. Uh, it's, oh, I, I don't know, I'll just, I'll, I'll call it overshooting, Sh shall we call it that? And what you do is you set your metronome maybe 10 or even 20 beats per minute faster than your upper limit. And, I mean, it's crazy. You, if, if you can't play beyond your upper limit, you're not really going to expect to play 10 or 20 beats per minute faster than your upper limit, right? But that's not the point. The point is to show these stubborn hands <laughs> that there are speeds above your current upper limit. There is more out there. That's what you're trying to show them. And so you shock them back into life by trying to play way above your max upper limit. And, of course, it, it would be a disaster because it's too fast. But something magical will happen when you drop the speed back down to your upper limit and then uh, bump it up by two. So you're just two above where your maximum limit was before. And now because you were playing so fast before, two above your maximum limit is actually slower by comparison to the crazy stuff you are doing before. So that's a good way to um, build speed from the other side by shocking yourself with speed and then bringing it down again. It's almost as if your hands are saying, okay, okay, no more of that high speed stuff. I give in, I'll give you a bit more speed above your max. Um, it really is a battle with the hands, uh, building up speed, but here are some techniques that you can use and should be using and correct metronome practice as well. So I think that's all six questions, isn't it? So uh, thank you for all these intelligent questions. I've tried to answer them as clearly and equally intelligently as I can. I really look forward to doing your Q&A number two because this was a lot of fun. It was really interesting to, to see what you guys wanted to know. Uh, so um, yeah, I don't know when I'm going to do the second one. Maybe in a month, maybe in two. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, get back to practice.